David, I went into neuroscience because I had the illusion that I thought I could understand consciousness. I got involved in a lot of exciting electrophysiology. Then I went bad into other fields, business and things. And the last few years I've been talking to physicists and philosophers about consciousness and they've totally confused me. So I'm really happy to get back to a real neuroscientist and ask him, what is consciousness? Well, let me say a few things. One of them is that consciousness, which let's operationally define it as the thing that flickers to life when you wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean by consciousness. One thing that's clear is that that's the smallest bit of what's happening in the brain. It's something that rides on top of a massive amount of machinery. My best view on consciousness right now is that it's successive levels of abstraction of all that machinery running underneath. So you've got very basic things like when I lift a coffee to my mouth, you know, there's a whole lightning storm of neural activity mm -hmm. that underpins that act. I'm not aware of any of that in my consciousness because I don't want to be. All I want is a very high level abstract representation, which is, am I succeeding or am I spilling it on myself? That's all I want to know. So consciousness in that sense is like the national newspaper. It just gives you a headline of how things are going. Um, it's, it's an abstraction of the machinery and the rest of the system. And the interesting part to me is it essentially can serve as a mirror for the rest of the system so that the system can see how am I doing in an abstract way, in time, in the big picture. So and it's like a feedback mechanism? Yeah. To see if you're going in the right direction? I think so. Um, Actually, I'll tell you what I think the best analogy for consciousness is, or at least the one that I'm, that I'm chewing on now that I think seems to work, which is that consciousness is like the CEO of a company. So if you think of a massive company with 100,000 employees, you've got the CEO at the top, and he or she, first of all, doesn't understand much of anything about the machinery underneath, mm -hmm. right? He doesn't want to go in and deal with people's cubicles and the cafeteria and the mailroom, doesn't want to know it. The job of the CEO is to sort of do the long-term vision planning and think about where the company's going and so on. If everything's running just fine in the company, the CEO doesn't even need to know. He gets to kick his feet up on the desk, doesn't need to care. Exactly the same with consciousness. If all my motor actions, if everything's going as expected, I don't even have to be very conscious. If I'm driving home from work and it's a drive I've made every day, I'm almost a zombie when I'm driving home. It's only when something surprising happens that the CEO has to sit up and say, okay, what's going on? And start searching through the, the system to figure out how to steer things. The interesting part that I've been thinking about lately is that when you look at the CEO of a company, he or she gets credit for sort of making the decisions of the company, but there's a very real sense in which he or she is tied into the company. There are all these nested feedback loops all up and down the system such that the CEO can't make some completely radical departure from the core competency of the company. Right, the CEO feels like, okay, I've got free will, but he doesn't actually. I mean, he's tied into this massive machinery and, and it's tied into him and he's tied into it. And so it's all one system. So when we think about what's actually deciding in the brain, what is it that steers our behavior? It's, it's our, what we think of as the conscious mind and all the unconscious machinery, they're tied in as one big system with all sorts of loopy feedback. Okay, giving you that, there are really two separate issues though. One is behavior. One, what does it take to drive behavior? The other is what it feels like inside, the subjective sense of consciousness. Because we can easily imagine a behavioral system to, to work exactly as you said, that is purely mechanical, purely robotic, nothing inside the so-called philosophical zombie, where everything looks the same in terms of the behavior, but inside there's nothing going on. In fact, most of our behaviors are exactly that. Most mm. everything you do is, they're, they're zombie systems. And not only what you do, but also what you believe, what you think, <laughs> how you act. All the stuff is generated by parts of the machinery we don't even have access to. Um, there's so many good examples of this. I'll just give one because I, I think it's so interesting. But um, there was a study years ago where men were rating the attractiveness of women's faces in photographs mm -hmm. from 1 to 10. And... In half the photographs, the women's eyes were dilated, just a little bit with eye drops. And the men were uniformly more attracted to these photos than these, and uh, none of them knew why. None of them were able to say, oh, well, her eyes were a little bit bigger here. 
And none of them knew, presumably, that, that dilated eyes is a sign of sexual readiness in women. <laughs> but their brains knew, their brains picked up on that, their mm. unconscious brains, woof, and drew them towards <laughs> that behavior. Right. Okay, so almost everything we do, it's not just motor behaviors, but how we think, what we're attracted to, what we believe in politically, religiously, and so on, is generated by parts of our brain that we don't have access to. So when you have an idea and you think, oh, I just thought of something, it wasn't actually you that thought of it, right? It was. It was all the subterranean cavernous machinery that came up with it. Eventually, it serves it up to you and you take credit for it. Um, okay, so I, so I agree with you on the point that most of our behavior and then some can be completely robotic right. and automated. Now, your other question is why does it feel like something? Um, that, that we don't know. Um, and the weird situation we're in in modern neuroscience, of course, is that not only do we not have a theory of that, but we don't know we don't know what such a theory would even look like. Right. Because nothing in our modern mathematics says, okay, well, do a triple integral and carry the two, and then yeah. here's the taste of feta cheese. So that's the challenge we're up against. Um, of course, people are searching for the neural correlates of consciousness. What can you find going on in the brain? And that's a, that's very good. I mean, that's that's progress that literally can be made. Exactly. And that's it's, fine. It's good, but it's not great. So it's good because we say, hey, this set of Christmas tree lights lights up when you're conscious of this or that. But it still leaves us feeling quite empty as far as why it feels that way. And the fundamental philosophical question, can Christmas lights lighting up in the brain ever be about something or have a content feel to it? How, how are the two? The so-called identity theory, where what you feel and what you sense inside in your mind, so to speak, is, literally is, identical to the flow of nerve impulses or chemicals flowing back and forth. Some people say that's, that's philosophically impossible, it's, that's logically impossible. They're not the same thing, so they can't be identical. Right, right, that's exactly right. And the situation that we're in is, um, we don't know how to build that. So if I give you 100 billion tinker toys and mm -hmm, ask you to start mm -hmm. putting them together and you hook mm -hmm. them up any way you want so they're communicating with one another, at what point would you add another tinker toy and say, ah, okay, now it's experiencing right. redness on the inside right. or something? And, and the question is, could you ever do that? In principle, could you ever do that? Right. I don't see how. Now, that is either A, a limitation of my imagination, or B, what it tells us is that, you know, Although materialism is sort of what's taken for granted in the field, meaning that we can take all the pieces and parts of the brain and put them together in this yeah, yeah. vast, complicated network and get consciousness, it might mean materialism is wrong. We don't actually know for certain. Now, the reason neuroscientists generally subscribe to materialism and the reason we go into lab every day and act as though it's true is because um, we have a million examples where if you damage the brain, that changes the person. It changes their conscious state, right? So there's this irrevocable relationship between the biology and conscious state. But that doesn't actually mean materialism has to be true. There are alternative theories that could be the case. Um, so I'm not, saying I, I'm not saying I subscribe to these theories, but let me just say agnostically that it is perfectly possible. Let me just give one example. Imagine, I, and I wrote about this in my book Incognito, imagine that the brain were like a radio receiver, and if you damage the radio, that changes your conscious state, right? I'm not saying that is true, but it's perfectly, it's exactly as consistent with the data in modern neuroscience as the materialist position.